We're supposed to have a drone flying around out there. Did we see that? I don't know. I wasn't out there in the lobby. Did we see the drone? No? Am I speaking Greek? There was no? Okay. Anyway, I was just going to point it out. But anyway, we've got uh, um, lots of stuff going on. Of course, it's summertime now, so thanks for, thanks for showing up here on the summer break. And uh, we're going to start by singing. And so we're going to sing several songs here right back to back. Just keep the music going and the praise going up to our God. So go ahead and stand up. And uh, let's get started. Thank you. 
God is that powerful and he's that loving and he's that trustworthy that whenever we're going through anything or struggling with anything like Dave's going to talk about specifically anger today um, some things that we uh, you know struggle with fight against uh, you know inside or outside whatever's going on we know that we can always trust him and this next song that I want to sing together is called yes I will it's one of my favorites that we uh, it's a commitment song to commit to no matter what's going on inside or outside of me. Yes, I will choose to praise. I will choose to praise the Lord.
guys can be seated. We're going to bring Dave. I was going to pray for our offering this week. All right. Wow. What's some powerful songs there, right? I mean, I wonder why sometimes we Christians seem so timid when we're singing about an all-powerful, almighty God. And so we should go out and share our faith and be strong. And so it is good to come together and to worship our awesome God today. Mercy it is very good. Hey, I just want to remind you of something. Next week is our church picnic. Looks like we've got a pretty good crowd showing up. And so we're calling next Sunday ch church picnic Sunday. You know, you can go ahead dressed in your church picnic clothes. As I said, if you're swimming, hey, don't wear the uh, thongs or anything in here. So, um, <laughs> you know, but anyway, come on in. Be prepared to go. Bring a covered dish with food in it. The meat will be provided. And there's directions. You can pick them up. You can go online. You can pick them up out here. It's only a few miles down the road from here. And so we're going to eat about, I think, 12, 45 or something like that. That's what it says. So uh, come on out. Have a good time. Meet some folks that you worship with every Sunday and just enjoy the afternoon. So we're looking forward to that. I want to keep that in mind. And also, uh, something else is, aren't these chairs nice and comfortable? Aren't they? Yes. Oh, man. It is a miracle how every Sunday they just show up here. You know what I mean? It's like, if you come in here, they're gone, and they show up. So what we decided to do was, we're going to give people the opportunity to help serve. Because in the morning, there's just a few folks who will come out about 9 o'clock and set those chairs up. And one of them is Caitlin. And Caitlin, if she reaches 5 foot, that's amazing. But I see her grabbing those chairs off that rack, and I'm like, oh, maybe i got to do something about this. And so next week, we're going to have a sign-up thing. And maybe for six months, you say, well, I can do these Sundays. And show up at 9 o'clock and fellowship and set up the chairs. We usually, we thank you guys for helping tear them down, because that's usually quick. But I just wanted to put that out there and so someone might even be coming to you if you look like you are healthy and strong and they might say hey would you like to sign up to a couple Sundays to set up some chairs and so if they do take it as a compliment you know you're like oh you look healthy so but uh, we're gonna be doing that having a little table where you can sign up for that and help us out we'd appreciate it and, and so then one thing about God God is so good and then we sometimes forget it if you're like me uh, get caught up in the things of this world and, and one of the ways that God helps remind us is don't don't get all excited about this world because someday I'm going to go speak at a memorial service this afternoon, a dedication service at a cemetery. And my sermon topic is, this is not my final resting place. So, um, and so we realize that this world, it really isn't our home. It sounds like a song, doesn't it? For those of you all older, like it is a song. You know, younger guys are like, what? Anyway, so we realize that God is good to us and we are blessed to be a blessing. And that's one of the reasons God talks about our giving. It's not like, oh, we want to mask all this money, mask all this money in our... No, if that happens, a church has got a lot of money, their account's got a problem, okay? Because we should be using it to the glory of God. And uh, so, you know, yesterday I was at a homeschool graduation thing, had to prayer, and I met a lady, and she came up and said, oh, I'm finally glad to get to meet you. I hear so much about you. I said, oh, that's not good. And... Um, <laughs> But then she started talking highly about the church and what the church does in the community. And I said, it is our goal as a church to try to help people in our community and our building is to be used to the glory of God. And that's what we try to do. And so even in our offerings, that's what we want to use them for, is to spread the gospel to help people who are hurting in our world. And so through that, you have the opportunity to give. Uh, you can either give you can text it or you can give on the app or online or also there's an offering that will be uh, received as you're leaving here. And so we're going to give thanks for that offering at this time and ask for God's guidance in that. So let's pray. God, you are good, good, good God. And Lord, I, it's hard sometimes. But sometimes I look at life and life seems to stink and be terrible. You're still good because this life is so short and you've prepared something else for us. And we thank you for that. And God, we thank you for the blessings you give us every day. And so as we give in return to show our love for you and our love for others, God, I know that you will bless us for the giving. And we just ask for wisdom to spend the money correctly that brings glory and honor to you, that we'll never be selfish, we'll never think this is ours, but we will always realize whose it is and, and who it belongs to so that we can help others and spread the love of Jesus. We love you, God. We give you thanks. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, after this next song, we're going to have our communion time. So if you haven't grabbed one of these little plastic things, um, the elements, excuse me, the official name for them. We have them on the side table over here and on the table in the back during this song would be a, um, a good time to go pick one up. Here. 
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Got my phone. I'm forgetful. Anybody else? My short-term memory isn't near what it used to be. We'll attribute part of that to my age. Uh, my next monumental birthday will be 70 years old. So just for a little bit of perspective there. But brain death starts in four to six minutes with no heartbeat, right? I was dead for 10 minutes. And everybody prayed. I'm standing here today alive because of you and your prayers. Okay, there's power in prayer. And when I was laying in the hospital, they didn't have any idea if I'd ever walk, talk, be able to do any number of things by myself. My son, oh, I'll get emotional. My son asked a question. He said, Dad, what? After you've been dead, your attitude is a little bit different than normal conversation. I said, what? because they were worried about me just being a vegetable. He said, uh, what's the firing order of a small block Chevy? One, eight, four, three, six, five, seven, two. Wow. Everybody smiled. They knew it was gonna be all right. And I'm surprised I even remember that now, of course I've got it written down. <laughs> <clears throat> but I love this verse from Jeremiah, the first half of Jeremiah 1.5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Hallelujah. Every one of us sitting, standing here today, God had a plan. He said, in the 50s, I'm going to need a mic. I'm going to make him tall, dark hair, good looking, smart. <laughs> what are you laughing for? But he knew us before he formed us. We're here for very specific reasons. 
Anybody disagree that? He knew us before he formed us. He knew what you were going to be because that's how he made you and me. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And that's from John 14. It's just really incredible that we're called to remembrance. Sometimes it takes a little bit of help. Sometimes it comes back from lots of study. It might be because of a scripture you just happened to read in your devotions the day before. Who knows? But it's incredible how we are called into remembrance and what that does for us. I would like you now to take your cup and peel the top layer and expose the bread. Okay, now, I would like you to fold it in half, and it will break. Just like they used to break bread together. It symbolizes the sharing at that time of communion. It also symbolizes the broken body. Of our Savior. You hold in your hand the body of Christ. Partake now of the body of Christ, which was given for you. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Partake of the blood of Jesus Christ. Father God, we just stand and sit here before you today in all of the love that you have for us, the sacrifice that you gave for us. Anyone that's lost a child knows it's a pain that you can't even talk about. And yet you willingly gave your son for us that we can eternally spend our time with you, but it's our choice. And we thank you, Jesus, for giving up your life that we'll all be able to commune together at the feet of our Father forever and ever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. All right. It is so great to be able to come together and to worship our God, isn't it? I mean, it really is. Most Sundays I come out here saying that, and you may be thinking, does he really mean that? Yes, I do. I look forward to this. I mean, yeah, there's some days you get up and things aren't, you know, it isn't a good day or something, so I come in. But as I come in and hear God's word and song, it starts lifting me up. And that's why I tell people, hey, don't come in here on Sunday morning complaining about anything. Don't talk about business with people because you're going to interfere with their worship time with God. And the world's got enough problems. It's a good time to come together and to worship our God. You know, um, we've got enough time to focus on all that kind of junk on every other day of the week. So I want to say a special hello to our guest here. It's always good that we have guests with us each week, and we're just excited that you are here with us. And, and one of the big things here at Hope Christian that we want to make sure of is that you feel welcome and that you see the love of Jesus when you come in here. That's very, 
very, very important. Now, we, you know, we mess up sometimes. I do apologize. I do apologize. And you may have noticed that uh, we haven't gotten the perfection thing down yet. Just for some reason, we haven't got that down. So if you feel like you haven't gotten the perfection thing down, welcome. You'll fit right in here. Just saying, you know, I want to do that. Now, this thing that we say, well, we're not really perfect, and it's not an excuse for us to keep sinning. Uh, it's not an excuse for us not to improve because our job when we come together is to encourage one another to try to be more like Jesus every day. So let's stand up, welcome some folks, and when you welcome them, say, thank God for mercy. All right? So. <laughs> We have started this series on the life of King David, and I've entitled it Flawed, Flawed. And it's my desire that we will see that in the past, God has used people to carry out his plan, even though people were flawed, because we are all are. And uh, now, like I said, God never excuses our sins. We even see that in David's life, where there was consequences for the wrong that he did. And so we will be held accountable. So in seeing this, we can realize that God can certainly use us, and as Mike talked about today, has a plan for using us to let others know about Jesus, his plan. Also, I hope that we can see the harm that that is done when we don't truly follow God, that we'll learn from people like King David and see and learn from his mistakes. Now, if you're like me, you can relate to the struggles and downfalls of these people in the Bible. And if you're honest, sometimes it's like looking into a mirror. You're like, you're reading this, you go like, oh, ouch, that, that's me. That, that's me. So this morning, we want to look at David and see one of the flaws that David has and, and, uh, and some of the problems he has, and maybe it, it kind of reflects on us too. Now, my friend Scott Gold was working for a large, a large catering company at one time. And uh, so, and Scott, you know, he, he liked doing this, working in this large business. And, and so they had a big meeting one day, and the big head honcho comes in. He's meeting with the people there. And he looks out and says, hey, I, I need some folks to volunteer to do some extra time. We're having a 25-year celebration of our business. Now, Scott, if you know, Scott is a volunteer at heart. And, and so he's volunteering. Plus, he's thinking, you know, uh, this might do good for me in, in the, you know, raise, going up in the company. And so Scott raises his hand, I'll volunteer, and the boss calls him forward, and the boss says to him, you know, hey, thank you, and we appreciate, what's your name? And Scott told him his name, and he stands Scott up front, he said, how many of you all will be like Scott and make a difference and volunteer to do some extra time as we have this great big celebration? Others volunteered. So the day the celebration came, and many celebrities, local celebrities were there, there was a local press there and everything, and, and so, you know, Scott's wanting to make sure he's doing his best because he loves to serve people, but also wants to be, you know, raised up in the company there and everything, and so they're doing well, but there was this one table where these people were very, you know, sort of uppity and snooty, and, and Scott was okay with that, you know, it doesn't bother him, but especially this one woman, I mean, she was just, oh, oh she was terrible, and, and the things that she was saying and demanding service right away, and, and she made some of the young girls cry, and that, that just made Scott angry, it made him angry, and finally Scott said, look, you know what, you're no better than the rest of us, lady, and we're serving a lot of people, but let me tell you something, you think you're so high and mighty, serving you is like feeding a hippopotamus in a zoo. And uh, the lady said, well, and she stood up and said, do you happen to know who I am? Scott said, no, I don't. I don't really care. She said, I am the owner's wife, and he is your boss. Scott said, well, big deal. Do you know who I am? She said, no. He said, good. See you later. <laughs> you see, sometimes 
our anger can lead us to do some wrong things. And that's what I want to talk about today. Today's message is anger. It is anger. As I mentioned last week's message, in America, and I don't know about other countries, we kind of have a difficult time dealing with popular people. Uh, we do that. We often demonize them. You know, it's easy, you know, when we find, uh, and all of us kind of do this, and they're the most terrible person ever, ever walked, ever lived. Or else we put them on a pedestal and all they can do no wrong. Popular people, you know, they, they can't do any wrong. When honestly, they're probably somewhere in the middle for all of us. We all have these. And uh, they're somewhere between the two extremes. Now, I've said that as a kid, I love the story of David. Because when I grew up, David was this little shepherd boy. And he was this small guy. And he was a guy after God's own heart. And he beat Goliath. And he becomes the king. And so David is like one of my heroes. And then as I mature, you're like, you mature, Dave? Really? Anyway, as I begin to mature, and I'm reading more about David. I'm like, oh, okay. So this is what David did also. You know, this is kind of a little bit disappointing here in David. And honestly, there's some things in David's life that I look at and you're like, I can't stand that. You know, that's sickening, you know, what David did. And so David was one of those flawed characters that we see, that you see the good he did, you see the bad he did, and also we uh, uh, can see, or I can see myself a lot in these characters in the Bible as a reflection, and so I want to learn from them. Now, in this series, we're not following a chronological, uh, in a chronological fashion, but we're, we're kind of jumping around during different periods in David's life. So today, as we're looking at this part of David's life, uh, he has secretly been anointed as king by Samuel, and uh, although Saul is still the acting king, He's still carrying out the duties of king. So David uh, has been called because Saul, once David, remember last week, was anointed as king, and the spirit of the Lord came upon Saul, but then, uh, excuse me, on David, but then Saul, the spirit of the Lord left him, and I said, that's a scary thought for me. When you turn against God and the spirit of God leaves because you've turned your back and you've walked away from him, he no longer is leading you in life. And so David has the Spirit of God in him. So David, Saul's having this terrible time, this evil spirit within him, junk going on in his life. And David comes, and David plays music for him. David was a musician. That was another thing I liked about David. He wrote many, he wrote many of the psalms, many of the songs that we even sing today come from some of the lyrics he wrote. And so David would soothe uh, Saul by playing these songs. And, and then David kills Goliath. And, and uh, all of a sudden, Saul is kind of like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. What's going on here? The people are out there in the street saying, like, David, Saul has killed his thousands, but David's killed his ten thousands. And, and so David is married finally to the king's daughter at this time. But then Saul totally turns against David. And finally, David has to flee and go into hiding. And David and his men are hiding. And Saul is hunting for David to kill him. And it's interesting when you see Saul's life. I, I mean, he, he's like, one minute, okay, I'm going to leave you alone, David. Next minute, I can't stand him. I'll kill him. I hate him. You know, he's, he's going after that, that evil that is within him. And so as we pick up today, um, David, uh, even David has had, during this time, David had an opportunity, we'll talk about this later on in another sermon, to take Saul's life. And David refused to do it. And so David is in the wilderness. David's out in, in the fields out here. He's hiding. And uh, so um, we, we come across this part here where David's men are hiding. David knows of this wealthy man named Nabal. Okay, and the ball is wealthy, and the ball is shearing his sheep. And during the time of sheep shearing, uh, there is a feast, a lot of food going on. Kind of reminds me almost of when you butcher hogs together as as neighbors. You know, you got all this food, and you're butchering hogs, and it makes me hungry thinking of it. But anyway, <laughs> he's shearing sheep. But the ball is this greedy, mean, and arrogant man, and he's married to Abigail. And Abigail, she is described as intelligent and beautiful. Opposites attract, okay? So I got set. Anyway, David, David sends 10 of his men to Nabal. And David says for the men to greet Nabal and wish him well. And let him know, you know, that it's sheep shearing time. And I know he's having a feast. And also let him know that we, David's men, we, we've been out there amongst the shepherds, amongst the sheep. And actually we made sure no harm ever happened to them. We actually kind of protected them. And so he said, can you share some food with us? And we're going to read and see what happens here. But before we do, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the day. 
thank you for the blessings of the day. And we thank you that you have recorded for us people's lives. And I, I can remember one time Mike Krause saying that, what if today uh, the Bible was being written about us? What would it say about our lives? So God, I am thankful that you have these things in writing where we, as James has said, can look at them and let them be a reflection of us to help us not make the same mistakes, to help us to follow you, to grow closer to you. And I pray, God, that you know that I am not worthy to present your word, but I thank you for your Holy Spirit who does. And I pray you would take this word and just impart it on all of us wherever we need it in our lives, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Samuel 25. 1 Samuel 25. I'm going to start in verse 9 because we've already read up to what... And by the way, Samuel has died at this time and so that was the uh that was the one who anointed david and so anyway david is out in this area here and he's watching his sheep he sends his men to nabal first samuel 29 uh 25 9 through 11 and when david's men arrived they gave nabal this message in david's name and they waited nabal's answer uh they waited and nabal answered david's servants who is this david who is this son of jesse Many servants are breaking away from their masters these days. Why should I take my bread and water and meat I have slaughtered for my shears and give it to men coming from who knows where? Oh, wow. Pretty unkind, right? Pretty just downright boom. And, and you know what? He knew David. He knew who David was. And you can tell that from the, the, the text. You can also tell from what Abigail says later on. So I want you to realize something in David's life. David's life was filled with emotional pressure. David's life was filled with emotional pressure. Emotional what? Pressure. Pressure. Half of y'all said that. Emotional what? Pressure. pressure. There's pressure on David. Emotional pressure. Think about the things that David has going on in his life. You know, last week we saw that it looked like David was this insignificant person. And uh, even in the eyes of his own father, it's very possible that Jesse did not look well up on him. And uh, some of the studies that we had seen about David and Jesse and so forth and so on. And he's also been uh, in battle, killing the enemy. So there's that fighting, that, that killing of the enemy. And now the king, who once said, you can marry my daughter, who listened to his music, but now is trying to kill him. So he's in hiding. And so he, he wants to kill him. So you talk about some emotional pressure. I mean, what else? Can you throw on this guy's plate, right? I mean, emotionally speaking, before he, the boiler just blows up. And so, and we don't know for sure if David, what we talked about last week, David's dad and, and how he kind of shoved him off to the side. We know he wasn't invited for the sacrifice. And, and so did he feel, you know, sort of let down by a father figure? And then the king, he's the king's son-in-law. What's the king do? He turns him down, sort of a father figure, uh, sort of belittling him. And then here's another male figure who, who uh, is kind of saying like, who is this David? Oh, belittling him. And like I said, we know he knew who David was. He had heard of this David. Because, and also because of what he says, talking about, you know, there's many a servant who's, who's left their masters. Is he just another one of these? And we also know because of what Abigail says later on. And, and so, you know, that could have been the match that this sort of struck with David right there. So David's life is full of emotional pressure right now. He's got a lot of stuff on him, a lot of junk. So now let's see how David reacts. Uh, and I'm going to read 1 Samuel 25, 12, and 13, and I'm going to jump to verses 21 and 22 just to get David's reaction. 1 Samuel 25, 12. David's men turned around and went back. And when they arrived, they reported every word. Every word. And David said to his men, Each of you strap on your sword. So they did, and David strapped his on as well. About 400 men went up with David, while 200 stayed with the supplies. Jump on down to verse 21. David had just said, it's been useless all my watching over this fellow's property in the wilderness so that nothing of his was missing. He has paid me back uh, evil for good. May God deal with David, be it ever so severely, if by morning I leave alive one male, all who belong to him. So you can read and hear David's hurt from the words. You can see that, like, you know what? I wasted all my time watching this guy's sheep, and this is the way he treats me. And so his anger causes him to make a decision in haste. In haste. Say haste. Haste. Yes. An unwise thing to do, making a decision while you're angry, ever happened to you. You know, it's not too smart. 
I remember quite a few years ago, uh, I was in Louisville, Kentucky for a conference. And while I was in there, Tammy calls me and uh, she tells me about a problem that one of the kids got into and he was in a, even had a problem there in school. So I wasn't happy, happy, happy. And my words to my wife were, what kind of kids are you raising anyway? <laughs> Good thing I was like eight hours away in Louisville, Kentucky. That wasn't too smart. But you know, one thing about it, when you say something in haste, I had time before I come home and the situation, I handled it so much better because I didn't make the decision in haste. But yeah, good thing I wasn't standing right there when I told my wife, what kind of kids are you raising? Y'all like, that was stupid. Yeah. So in haste, be careful of that. So David quickly decides, 400 men, get your swords. Come on, man, mount up, 200 of y'all, y'all stay with this. We're going to take care of some business. David uh, does this at other times in his life, too. You know, in a couple of weeks, we'll, we'll see that David makes a decision in haste. He says something in haste. We actually even condemns himself without realizing it when he said something in haste because he was angry. But meanwhile, back at the ranch, meanwhile, back at the ranch, one of Nabal's men goes to Abigail and, and, and Nabal's wife and says, Houston, we got a problem. We got a problem here. And he said, tells Abigail, 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 that's good. Abigail, David's men were here and they asked for some food. And David and his men, they were out in the fields the whole time we'd been out there with the sheep. And they were watching over us and, and taking care of things. But Nabal just insulted him, man. I mean, really slapped him down. And, uh, you know, this is not going to turn out good. I'm afraid we're going to have some big problems here. Now, here's a smart woman, all right? She tells her servant, get all the food, get this, get, you know, you can see a list of this food. Get all this food together, load it up, you go on before me, and I am coming. And, and, uh, and so she's a smart woman, pretty woman, and food. I mean, you want to get to a man, boom, there you go, you know. I, I think back when I first started dating Tammy, one of the things she did was cook the meal, invited me into the house. I should have seen it coming. I should have seen it coming. No, she's, yeah, she's back there saying, Dave, you wait, you wait. Anyway. She always reminds me, if I ever complain, don't look like you're hurting too much, Dave. I'm going to tell you right now. So anyway, but here she is. She goes to meet David, and she bows down before him, and she apologizes for her husband, and she stops a massacre, because that's what's going to happen, trust me. When you read David's life, it would have been a massacre. There would have been no mercy. You know, there it is. So David's life is full of emotional pressure. He makes the mistake of acting in haste. But let's see how David responds to Abigail in 1 Samuel 25, 32 to 35. So it says here, David said to Abigail, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who has sent you today to meet me. May you be blessed for your good judgment and for keeping me from bloodshed this day and from avenging myself with my own hands. Otherwise, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, who has kept me from harming you, if you had not come quickly to meet me, not one male belonging to Nabal would have been left alive by daybreak. And then David accepted from her hand what she had brought him and said, go in peace. I have heard your words and granted your request. Even though David never sought this, even though he never sought this, he received counsel. He received counsel. What did he receive? Counsel. Yeah, he received counsel. David was angry, and he should have sought counsel, but he didn't. He acted hastily. David wasn't thinking clearly about the mistake that he was about to make, shedding innocent people's blood. He wasn't thinking clearly. You know, David uh, clearly has this leaning toward bloodshed. I mean, if you look at David's life, he was a warrior, all right? God used him in that way, yes. But I mean, to tell you, a lot of times it's like, here, what are we going to do? We're going to kill him, guys. I mean, the first thing that happened, we're going to kill him. That's what we're going to do. What are we going to do, David? We're going to kill him. That's what we're going to do. We're going to wipe him out. I mean, you look at David's life. That was pretty much it. Just kill him. You know, that's, that's, the, that's the answer. You're going to find that out even more as we look in the day for David. But David was a warrior, and God used his warrior ability, abilities. However, you can see uh, when he is angry, things don't go well. David's life is full of emotional pressure. He makes a decision when he is angry and in haste. But finally, he receives counsel. And, and we must be careful of allowing our anger to rule us, okay? I think that's what we can learn from us. Be very careful about allowing anger to rule our lives, to take over and rule us. Uh, and um, we must realize that Satan loves to use anger to cause turmoil amongst God's people. 
So how do we stop the devil from allowing anger to control us? How do we do it? I want to use this short video clip because I don't want you to forget it this morning, okay? And here is what we should do in this situation. Listen to the lyrics. Here goes the clip. should crank that thing up, man. I'm going to bring a guy here to do some worship with us, too, one time, man. I love it. Y'all too white out there. I'm just saying, man. man. We were at a CIY one time. I remember this preacher was up there preaching. I saw what he was starting to do. You know, he starts like, I mean, first of all, we had this kid named CJ with us from Paul Paul. And CJ's got this big fro. And we're sitting about three rows back, CIY. And this guy sitting there, he's like, Y'all are just too white. And CJ's like, what about me? What about... I still remember that. I'll never forget that. But I remember he's preaching. He's like, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. I'm like, y'all's too white. Y'all just sitting there. He's like, it's Friday. And I thought, I know what he wants. It's, and Sunday's coming. I was like, uh-huh. You know, and all the crap kind of turned around looking at me. He said, it's Friday. But Sunday, I was like, that's right. You know, and I, finally the whole crowd starts getting into it a little bit, you know. Um, but I love that. I love that soul in your worship, man. So, don't let the devil ride. Say that. Say that one more time. Yes. When it comes to anger, don't let the devil ride, because if you do, he's going to drive, okay? I love that song. Look it up. Neil Robertson, check that song out. Don't let the because it goes on, you know. Uh, don't let the devil drive, because if he drives your car, he's going to take you too far. Uh, so it's true. In Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, because what do you mean by that? Don't let the devil ride. That makes sense. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, Paul writes, In your anger, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. I believe that when Paul is writing this, trying to see uh, the, the, the original language, that he is saying that when you allow this anger to simmer within you, you're giving the devil a foothold. Y'all know what it's like if you have brothers and sisters and they're chasing after you and you go into the room and shut the door, you know, I mean, because right there at the house, in, in the old farmhouse, and it's still there. One time, Davy and Danielle, they were uh, having a fight about something, and she goes running after him, and Davy shuts the bedroom door, and she shows this high-heeled shoe, and there's a hole in the door about that big. <laughs> It's still there. But anyway, you know it's like your brother and sister, and they're trying to get in the room. Don't open that door. If they get their foot in that door, they're going to get in and get you. And so that's the way it is with Satan's life. Don't let anger simmer within you because it will destroy you and eat you up. When we allow our anger to go uncontrolled, we open the door for more evil in our hearts. Anger can be the result of selfishness, okay? It can be the result of selfishness. What do I mean? I really don't get angry about things I don't care about, right? So I'm going to tell you this story that most of y'all know that Dave doesn't like to shop, all right? And so Tammy has an eye appointment this week. She's like, you know, Dave, can you drive me? Because sometimes they dilate, to, you know, she couldn't drive. So I'm like, okay. But then she says, there's six, six I think it's six words. I need to stop at Costco. <laughs> Costco. Costco, okay? I'm on shop. I, and I'm trying to, Lord, help me to be the man I should be. Tammy, do you know what you need to pick up when you go to Costco? Yes, I only need this, this, this. I'll be married 40 years this coming week. I know better, you know? So here we go into Costco. And sometimes God leaves because I need to talk to Judy Hot, and lo and behold, she was in Costco. But anyway, we go in. First of all, I don't like a place when you feel like a common issue and you have to carry the card and you walk in like, you're going in. You know, and I know some of y'all love Costco. Don't hate me for this. Anyway, we go in there and sure enough, you know, 
What do you got to get, Tammy? Let's go get it. So we go in there. The first thing after we walk by the, she goes, oh, Dave, will you get one of them for me? I'm like, this ain't on the list. It's not on the list. So we go on back, and then she says, oh, you see that TV there? We need to get on like, mm, 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 mm. Because dad's moving out there and we need to pick up one for that. Anyway, I'm like, okay, we're going to get, we got to get. But then she gets back there and it's like me. I go go in. There it is. I'm going to pick it up. I'm going to throw it in the cart. I'm going to get it. No, 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 not Tammy. I'm like, what are you looking at? Oh, I'm looking at the date on here. I'm like, okay. So then we're going on by and, you know, you, you know she sees this. Got to stop and get that. But then you know me. I walk fast, right? So I'm pushing the cart. I'm moving pretty fast. But let me tell you something. You ever, I about ran over two or three people. You ever try to stop one of the things when you got like 500 gallon of water and bottles in your cart? You know, you're like, Ooh. you know, like that. And so anyway, finally we make it through. Now, she's, I, I did not get angry, but she wasn't happy, happy, happy with me because y'all can tell I can't keep my mouth shut. So anyway, <laughs> after 40 years. And so anyway... And we get outside like Tammy, and we're opening up a business outside every Costco, right beside their lot. I am going to rent blinders like a horse so that you cannot see what you're not looking for. And I'm going to rent mules to pull the cart out through there. Look at that. Clay Bennett's like, amen, brother. There you go. All right. I'm thankful I didn't get angry. I still got in trouble. But anyway, I, yeah, because sometimes our selfishness leads to our anger. And sometimes anger comes from unresolved issues. And I'm not a psychologist, psychologist, psychiatrist, counselor, so I'm not trying to do that today. But I'm saying there's times that we've got stuff locked up inside of us, and we've never, ever dealt with it. And so we get angry about stuff that really, really isn't the true problem. And, and uh, David, I think, came to learn that. In Psalms 147, 3, it says, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. You see, the Bible doesn't say it's a sin to be angry. It says, in your anger, do not sin. Jesus himself got angry a couple times, a righteous anger, but he didn't sin. He didn't allow it to become uncontrolled. He didn't let the devil ride, okay? He didn't let the devil ride. Now, many years ago during a Knicks Bullets game, and I love that because back before the world got crazy, the basketball team was actually called the Bullets, but then they thought they would stop violence by not calling them the Bullets anymore. So I don't know how that worked out. But anyway, the Knicks and the Bullets were playing playoff games. And the bullets came up from behind, uh, behind, one of the bullets came up behind the great Walt Frazier, if you're familiar with years past basketball, and he punched him in the face. Strangely enough, the foul was called on, uh, Walt, uh, it was called on Walt Frazier. So anyway, Frazier didn't complain. And a matter of fact, his facial expression never changed. He simply kept calling for the ball, and it was amazing enough that he scored the next seven buckets in a row. You see, there's a great moral lesson there. It's how you handle your anger. And I said the Bible doesn't say anger is a sin. It is uncontrolled anger that destroys us. And as a matter of fact, anger not only affects us emotionally and spiritually, but also physically. You can read reports. Uh, one of them is from a doctor's report from uh, Coral Gables, Florida. And they, they were watching and examining people's hearts. And they took these men who had coronary heart problems and healthy men, and, and they did these different stress tests on them. But the one thing they noticed is that when these men got angry is when it caused problems with the heart and the blood flow in their life. Whenever anger showed up. And so you've usually heard it when people really get angry. Or watch your blood pressure. And so we realize that anger is not healthy for us. And so, um, for, so we need to realize. We need to realize how important it is that we don't go blowing our stack and holding on to things in our life. But we try to have control. And like I said, if there's unresolved things, you know, then, then get some, somebody you can talk to and, and find out what's going on. And so what are some ways we can deal with anger? Well, the first thing is we can practice trusting in God. You know, here's one of the things I've told myself, even without anger. When something comes, I'm like, God, what's going to happen? And then God reminds me, David, <clears throat> haven't I, remember when this happened, didn't I take care of that? And David, do you remember when this happened? Didn't I take care of that? God also does this to me. I mean, it's not like an audible voice like, oh, okay, speak up, God, I can't hear you, but nothing like that. But do you remember that, God? Or this one, here's the one that really gets me. If I am worrying or doubting, what am I really saying? I don't trust you, God. And that's really what I'm saying. And you're like, but, 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 no, 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 but if God has all things in control, even when things stink and things are awful, if I'm upset and I'm all worried about something, God kind of pecks me on the shoulder and says, what you're really saying is you don't trust me, Dave. 
Yeah, that's truly the answer. So in our anger, it was Abraham. So another thing we can do, so practice trusting God, get good counsel. Even if it's coffee cup counseling, as they call it, where you've got a friend and you can begin to talk things and just speak and talk things out. Because you'll see people who have anger, anger, anger. And when you talk to them, nothing. They see nothing. There's nothing wrong. There's no problem. It's not there at all. Nothing penetrates. And so find some counsel. You know, it's, it's not bad if you even go seek professional counsel. That's not a bad thing. Like, you share, you're a Christian. You shouldn't seek professional counsel. It's like, what? Are you crazy? If you're sick, do you go to a doctor? Okay. You know, same thing. Sometimes, but sometimes it's just that coffee cup counseling that helps you with your anger. Abraham Lincoln, Secretary of War, Edwin Staunton, was angered by an Army officer who accused him of favoritism. So Stanton complained to Lincoln, who suggested that Stanton write the officer a sharp letter. So Staunton did and showed the strongly worded letter to the president. And so what are you going to do with it, president asked, Lincoln asked. Surprised, Staunton replied, well, I'm going to send it. Lincoln shook his head and said, no, you're going to throw it in the stove and burn it. Then you're going to go back in and write another letter when you're not angry. And I think that is good counsel. Find the source of your uncontrolled anger. If there's uncontrolled anger, find, try to find a source. If somebody loves you and keeps telling you, you get angry all the time. Don't go like, I do not get angry all the time. You know, take a minute and go like, wait a minute. This person loves me and this person says it too. And a lot of times it's sad. You talk to people and you're trying to help them. And when they'll sit there and go like, hmm, no. I'm like, dude, there's three or four people in here telling you the same thing. So try to find out what the source is. And, and uh, uh, of that anger. And, and with David, it possibly here could have flared because of his background, his life. But here's another one. Here's a big one. Forgive. Oh. Forgiveness is not weakness. Forgiveness does not say, what you did to me was okay, and you should be able to do it again. No. Forgiveness is for you and for God. God forgives me all the time. And I don't deserve forgiveness, okay? I'm like, all right, Dave, you dummy, you did it again. You idiot, you know, and, and God forgives me. When you forgive someone, you're not saying what you did was okay and it's all right. What you're saying is, I will not allow you to have the control over my life and destroy me. I will forgive, and I will pray about forgiveness, and I will forgive, and I will love as hard as it is. Didn't say I might not like that person. I might not be able to trust that person the rest of my life. I understand that. I get that. That's not unforgiveness. Forgiveness is I'm not going to hold this in my heart. I'm not going to sit there and wait for something bad to happen to them so I can laugh because guess what? They've rented space in your mind for free, baby. If they're continually, if you're continually talking about something that's happened to your past, somebody's did to you, hey, you're just letting them get to you for free, man. They're living their life forgive. Practice forgiveness, and that helps you with uncontrolled anger. And um, work on overcoming selfishness, because anger is often, like I said, we don't get upset about something that we don't care about. A lot of times it's selfishness. And, and, my, and Tammy, quit taking notes back there, because you're not going to be able to use this on me all the time, right? So, uh, but th sometimes that happens. It's, it's our selfishness. But here's the big one. Pray. Pray. When you're angry, God, here I am. I tell people at funerals, you know, if you're angry with God, that's okay. God's a big God, and you can be angry with God. It, it, but here's the key. Don't stay angry with God, okay? Because God knows he made us. He understands us. It's okay if you get angry. Just don't stay angry. And then pray, pray. We can see in David's life that he grew more and more to control his anger. I mean, David set boundaries in his life. We, we'll talk about this here in a couple of weeks where David had the opportunity to kill King Saul. And even, I'm sure the men were like, kill him, kill him, come on, this is your opportunity. You know you're the next king, take his life. But David set a boundary. I will not kill one of God's anointed, one of his chief. If it's going to happen, God's going to do it. Not me. I'm not going to have that blood on my hands. I won't do it. David began to set those boundaries in his life. You read the Psalms and you see how David worked on controlling the anger in his life. Uncontrolled anger never brings the results we desire. James writes in James chapter 1, verses 19, 20. James 1, 19, 20. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak. And, uh, excuse me. Quick, slow to speak and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. God has a plan. I'm going to ask our praise team to come forward this time. God has a plan. And he uses flawed people like you and like me to carry out that plan.
But if we are angry, we cannot be the kind of Christian that God wants us to be. Uh, if we live an angry life, what kind of witness are we to people around us? And, and, and that, that's something we have to work on, realize, you know what, I'm supposed to be a witness, an ambassador for Jesus. And, and how am I behaving where people see me? Where people, and you know what, if I handle things right when people don't see me, when they do see me, it'll just come out naturally, the good things. Bruce Goodrich was being initiated into the uh, cadet corps at Texas A&M University. And one night, Bruce was forced to run until he dropped. He never got up. Bruce never got up. Bruce Goodrich died before he even entered college. A short time after the tragedy, Bruce's father wrote this letter to the administration, faculty, and student body in the corps of the cadet, core of the, core of the cadets. I would like to take this opportunity to express the appreciation of my family for the great outpouring of concern and sympathy for Texas A&M University and the college community over the loss of our son, Bruce. We were deeply touched by the tribute paid to him in the battalion. We were particularly pleased to note that his Christian witness did not go unnoticed during his brief time on campus. Mr. Goodrich went on, I hope it will be some comfort to know that we harbor no ill will in this matter. We know our God makes no mistakes. Bruce had an opportunity with, uh, excuse me, Bruce had an appointment with his Lord and now secure in his celestial home. And when the question is asked, why did this happen? Perhaps one will answer so that many will consider where they will spend eternity. You see, what if Bruce's parents were angry and flamed out in anger? What a witness would that be? Here, to have that kind of heart, to say, you know what, God, Bruce had an appointment with God, and maybe this happened so that others might come to know Jesus. We cannot allow our anger to control us. Because when we do, when we allow this anger to control us, many times it ruins our witness. And we need to own lostness. What do I mean by that? When we see a lost community, we don't just talk about it. Isn't it terrible how many drugs are in Hampshire County? What are you doing about it? It's our problem, okay? We know Jesus. We know the answer. We have a job. But if we're always angry about everything, and mad about everything, what kind of witness are we going to be for Jesus? We want to be help, hope, and home. You know, when I kind of jokingly talked about the lady who met me at this a homeschool graduation, and, and she said, oh, I've heard, I finally get to meet you. I've heard a lot about you, and I jokingly said, oh, that's not good, but in my heart, I'm thinking, I hope that is good that you know about me, because I'm supposed to represent Jesus Christ, not just because I preach here at Hope Christian Church, but because I am a child of God, and that's all of us. We can learn from David that uncontrolled anger causes nothing but chaos and ruins our lives and ruins our witness. We want to be people, and maybe you're here today, you're struggling with this, and this isn't a slap down, a smack down of shame on you. No, it's, what can we do to help one another? How can we help one another? We're in the same boat together. We're not going to judge somebody because they're dealing with this sin or that sin. What can we do to help us grow to be more like Jesus? You know, our God is an awesome God who loves us through the good and through the bad, and he showed that in David's life. It's the same in our lives. So we want to stand today. If you have a need, we have prayer partners in all four corners of the building, and I'll be down here. And whatever your need is today, don't put it off. Don't wait. Follow Jesus. If you need prayer, you're like, yeah, I am dealing with anger. You know, seek out help and look for prayer. We're all in the same boat together. But let's be witnesses for Jesus Christ and live the way that he desires us to live. Father, we thank you for the life of David. And God... I thank you that we not only see the good things he did, but we also see the mess he made, just like us. I thank you that you're patient and you're kind. God, help us not to be people who are controlled by anger. God, help us not to let the devil ride, but help us to realize that we want to turn to you with all of life's situations. Help us to be the ambassadors you've called us to be, to make a, a positive difference in people's lives for you. If there's somebody here today who needs to make a decision for you, I pray that today would be that day, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. You 
stood before creation eternity in your hand you spoke the earth into motion my soul now to stand you stood before That's what we need to do, offer our hearts completely to God. Whether it be anger or whatever it might be, don't let the devil ride, all right? Remember that this week. Don't let him ride, because you let him ride, he's going to drive, all right? And we don't want that. We want to be able to live for him. And, and any time that you think, you know, I need some help with something, and, and maybe somebody's going to think this is stupid, no, nah, there's nothing stupid. There's nothing, oh, I'm, I feel like I'm crazy. We've all had those days. You know, if somebody knew how I was feeling, if somebody knew what I was thinking, they think I was crazy. I can't share this. Oh, yes, you can. Yes, you can. We're the family of God. And I would tell you, if anybody ever brings confidence to you and you ever share that, shame on you and God would deal with that. Don't ever do that. But let's be there for one another. Let's encourage one another. And let's make sure that we do not let anger control us, 
but let's be a witness for Jesus Christ. And so I challenge you this week, go out in the community, invite some friends to come out next week. As we heard, I think next week is David's strengths and his weaknesses, I think. And so uh, he's strong and he's weak. And you have to come out and see what that is. And we'll learn from the life of David, try to pick up his good points and say, ooh, those bad ones look like me. I don't want to do that anymore. And go forward. So have a great week. And uh, don't forget, next week's the church picnic after worship. Have a great time of fellowship, sharing and food, meeting one another. Yeah, I was about to mention the church picnic. Dave just mentioned that. Um, and like he said, being a family, we should be able to feel comfortable approach, approaching each other with our problems without, uh, without fear of judgment. We're all loving each other and helping, uh, helping each other out, just follow Jesus the best we can. Um, that's the atmosphere we try to create here. That's what, the, what God wants for us. And so, uh, so I hope we feel that way coming here uh, if you're part of a small group or a ministry coming here all together on Sunday morning, that we feel like we're a family here, that we can talk to each other and help each other out with anything. I'm going to pray, and we're going to be dismissed this week. Like Dave said, go out and, uh, um, yeah, be the light. Help spread God's kingdom. And then next week, church picnic. Dear God, thank you so much for forgiving us and for uh, loving us despite all of our faults. None of us are perfect, as you know, and we know help us to uh, always remember that you are the only perfect one and uh, you are so great and loving you love us so much despite all of our imperfections and uh, thank you for the examples we have in your word from uh, from king david's life and so uh, we just want to thank you for uh, giving those to us so that we can learn to follow you best to please you to expand your kingdom that's my prayer for all of us this week as we go out we will just be working um, our lives to live for your glory and for your kingdom and for your will to be done on earth and however we can just be a part of that with our lives. Just help us. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.